see if that works. Better with a GoPro where I can just stick it on there and have it straight every single time. Those are smaller cans, those are funny. I don't know why their cans are smaller. I'll talk about home improvement stuff. It's kind of fun. I've been doing a lot of that lately. Actually, over the past few years, I've been doing different kinds of home improvement things. Mostly to make my home more comfortable, but it also increases the resale value if you do it right. You kind of have to do everything with taste. Because without taste, you can get yourself in trouble. For example, one time I went into a home, we were looking to purchase a home. It was our first one. We looked at several options. And one of them had this thing above the back door, the back sliding door. And it was a, uh, I don't know what it was, it was this giant thing made out of sheetrock and textured. And, I mean, it was well made. Some kind of a modern art looking thing. It was really weird though. On the right side, there was this, like a circle, and then a straight piece stuck out of it that went across the top of the window. And then there was like a triangle piece somewhere, I don't remember where, it was, gosh, 12 years ago. But I just remember walking into that house, seeing that thing, turning around and leaving because while it was a home improvement it was probably tasteful to some people it was awful to me So, you have to make sure you don't do anything radical and strange like that, or it will actually turn buyers away, as that one did. So what are some things you can do for home improvement? 
Well, here are the things that I've done that have made a big difference in the value of the home. Number one is flooring. Flooring can make a huge difference. There's lots of people that like carpet, but a good high quality wood or a tile floor can be a lot better seller because they're more resilient. They last longer. If done properly, they last longer. And um, they're easier to maintain. Personally, I've been fortunate enough to be able to find good flooring at great prices. In fact, a lot of the flooring that I had in my older home was tile flooring that I got from an overabundance of someone else's job. They overbought by like 30 or 40 percent, and the home that they overbought for was so big. And I think it was only 20 percent, but the home that they bought for was so big that that extra 20 percent covered my home. And an extra 15% about beyond that. So I basically got a whole bunch of tile for a really good price. Buying it from someone else. All I had to buy was the uh, other materials. And I didn't actually do the entire floor in my home, so I did most of it. I did not do the bedrooms. But I had a lot of leftover tile. Enough that I even had some for the new home that I'm in now. Not for the entire floor, but for the bathrooms and we still have stacks of this stuff. So, if you can find deals like that, you can sometimes take them. You gotta watch out though, because one of the things we did find was even with that deal, we bought it a long time ago, it wasn't the most well-made tile. So, if you put the, if you put one piece of tile on a level surface, you could actually spin it. And that's not good because that means the corners turn up. That means you'll get catches if you don't exactly level it. It's really difficult. And we had a few. The problem with the catches is they'll chip on the corners when they do that or they'll mess up legs of furniture and stuff. You gotta be careful with that. Now, when you're doing things like tile and stuff, good morning. When you're doing things like that, surface prep is extremely important. Good morning. See, carpet is extremely forgiving with surface prep. You may feel some things, but if you get a good quality pad for carpet, which by the way, if you're doing carpet, the pad is more valuable than anything. A good quality pad and a cheap carpet is better than a good carpet and a 
in no pad or a terrible pad because the pad will wear out so fast. And a good quality pad hides the flaws in the floor and the concrete underlayment or the subfloor if you got that. So I recommend if you're going to do carpet, I recommend investing in a good quality pad. And if you have enough to afford the good quality carpet, go with that. Carpets usually only last about six years, ten years if you go industrial. So be aware of that. On your left. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good Love the helmet. Huh? Pretty good. I love that helmet. Good morning. Now, if you're getting ready to sell your home, it might be worthwhile to invest in some good quality carpet and pad right at that moment. Have it installed just before you lift it because people will come in and see a nice fresh carpet and be excited. Just some things to consider. Basically you don't want to It's kind of, it would sound like a waste, but let's say you spend $2,500 on new carpet in some of your rooms, maybe even three or 4000 By putting that there, if it's done tastefully and done well, you can add fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 to the value of your home and list it for a much higher price with new carpet. You can also do the same thing with new cabinets, kitchen stuff, things like that. Those will increase the value of your home. So sometimes it's worthwhile to spend a little on those things and get a return on investment later. I'll tell you what we did in the old home that we had, we did some huge improvements in the kitchen. The home was built in 1987, and because of that, it had one of those low ceiling kitchens with a big fluorescent light in it. I hate those. You get in there and it feels like it's all enclosed. It had a big, huge island counter that the previous owner had tiled. It was nice tile, but they didn't have a strong enough underlayment on the tile. So they had made a little bit of a bar. And because of the weight of the tile and the glue and all that, it was bending and causing it to crack. And ants would come through it. It's pretty nasty. Good morning. So we decided to basically rip it all out. We used the same cabinets for the most part. We bought a couple of extras and we rearranged the kitchen.
so many PC cruisers in this town. Anyone who says a PC cruiser was not successful needs to come to Las Vegas. You see them everywhere. I actually owned one as well and I loved it. Well, that's another story for another day. Anyway, so here's what we did with our kitchen. We, uh, we took that ceiling, raised it up as high as we could go because the rest of the living or the dining room area was a raised ceiling. So we lifted it up as high as it could go. We, um, we had a little bit of a problem with some gas lines, so we had to create kind of a soffit area. And we put some recessed lights in the soffit. And that was kind of nice. I wanted to put some recessed lights in the big ceiling. See, this is the big But I couldn't. Um, at the time, I didn't know how to do it, so I didn't bother with it. Now that I know how to do it, I'd put them everywhere, but at that time, I didn't bother with it. We, um, the kitchen used to be a U shape with a peninsula. We took out the U, we took out the peninsula, rearranged the cabinets, made the kitchen follow the wall a little bit more with an L shape. Changed the way things were done. We got ourselves a double oven set, put that into a cabinet, put that against the wall, got ourselves a regular cooktop with no oven, put that in there with an air hood. This is stuff that we actually got from, from a previous remodel from another home. Good quality stuff, we just got it a real good deal. And changed the countertop, we stuck with tile. I found some granite tile for like, like a dollar a square foot or something, so it was ridiculously low. <clears throat> I spent less on the tile, materials, underlayment, and a saw for 300 bucks than I would have had I purchased a crappy Formica countertop. Micah countertops are terrible because they're not, but I'm saying had I gotten the cheapest one, I would have spent $200 more on that than I did on this tile stuff. So it's a pretty good deal. I don't recommend tile for a countertop though because water seeps in and cracks and you can get some problems. So. I do recommend other countertops. But anyway, then the other thing we did was we got some more cabinets. And I got a wood countertop from Ikea and built myself an island that was actually movable. I wanted to put casters on it, but I didn't. But I wanted to. Would have been great. Some cash with brakes. Would have been able to move that thing all over. And I even made it with a seating area like a bar so that people could sit there and eat or sit there and converse while someone's doing something, whatever.
all in all, we spent probably about seven grand on the kitchen. We got a twenty thousand dollar return on investment. I think we got more than 20 return on investment. The problem was all of that ended up going to the bank rather than to us because of the values of homes anyway. Because everybody in this town right now is upside down. So it was kind of a bummer, it was a loss, but it was, we used it, so it was money worth spending. We used that kitchen and the island and everything, and we loved it. So another thing I've done I did in this home. I didn't do it in the kitchen. In the other home, actually, I had someone else do it. But I had someone teach me how to do it here. Like a switch. I'm telling you, PT cruisers are everywhere here. Anyway, so I had someone teach me how to do recessed lighting. And once I learned how to install them, it became pretty much a no-brainer. I learned that if done right, recessed lighting can give you an investment of well over 10 grand just for a few hundred dollars worth of lights. So immediately when I got into this new home, that's the first thing I did. And it looks amazing. I spent uh, less than 300 bucks I still haven't even finished it totally, but I've done all the spending. Hey guys, let's go this way. So, I was able to put recessed lighting in every room. I've got the cans in every single room. Most of them are four. I even have two in the hallway. Um, I haven't done the bathrooms yet. But I'm going to put two in one shower and one in another. Oh, look at me. Now we'll be fun. Marlon? Hey, check out that bus. I don't know if I'd want a bus that big. That's cool. Hey, little buddy. I think this all the way to the top. Let's go left from there. Couldn't hold the stand. Darn it. I'm not very good at track stands. So anyway, 
the recessed lighting is really easy to install. First thing you want to do though, is take one of the, um, you want to take one of the, the trim pieces and use a pencil to make a mark on the ceiling. You can always paint over it if you don't like it. But you can make marks on the ceiling to where you want to go. And I used a lot of measurements. I'd measure out the ceiling and use some math to kind of put it in the right place. And once I knew where they were going by drawing them out, I could get things prepared. Now after you draw it out, you want to drill a small hole in the center of it and put like a bent piece of pipe or a bent piece of wire in it or something. I think I used a bent piece of copper pipe or a copper pipe with an elbow. If you can't get up into the ceiling, this is what you do. If you can, then you just have somebody stick something up there and you find it and you look around. It's the best way to do that. But if you can't, you um, put a bent piece of pipe or wire or whatever in there and you use it to fish around and see if there's anything obstructing where the can would go. So you do that and then you have, um, you have a good idea and if there's something there Because you just put a small hole and not a big one, it's easy to patch. You can just throw some spackle on top, smooth it out, and you're good. If you already cut it, you're stuck with this big hole. You gotta find drywall and retape it, and that's no, no fun. Fortunately, I was smart enough not to do that. Light doesn't look like it works on the right side.
Really? Thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed it.